Hello everyone, welcome to Living History and the third episode in my special series based on the audio of the documentaries I made in France and Belgium in November last year. And this one is probably my favourite of the three. We've done Walking the Somme, we've done Behind the Lines, and now this one is based on the town of Ypres, um, known during the war as Ypres, its French name, but it has always been known to the locals by its Flemish name, which is Ypres. It's a really wonderful town. And most people, when they visit this area of Belgium, go out into the battlefields. They go and see Passchendaele, they see Polygon Wood, they see Messine Ridge and Hill 60, all these wonderful sites. But what you should also do when you're there is spend some time in the town itself because the town was completely destroyed during the war and has been painstakingly rebuilt. And it's really just a really wonderful place to go and absorb that World War I history. And so I hope you enjoy this documentary. Please go and download the video. You can see that. You can get that for free on Facebook and on YouTube. But in the meantime, enjoy this audio as we take a walking tour of the town of Ypres. This is the town of Ypres in Belgium and today it's a bustling market town. But in the First World War, particularly in 1917, the fighting that took place in the fields near this town was some of the most savage of the entire First World War. And most people when they come to visit take the opportunity of heading out into those fields, as indeed they should. But the town itself is integral to the story. All these buildings around me were absolutely pulverised during the war and today they tell a story, not just about the war, but about the people who lived here in those dark years. That's what we're going to explore today. Welcome to Ypres. This is the Cloth Hall, which is the centre of trade here, built in the 13th century. And it's the most iconic building in Ypres, both now and, of course, during the war. This was where cloth was bought and sold and traded. And it had a very strong connection with Britain as well, because British wool was sent over here and then made into these very fine cloths which were distributed all over Europe. And it made this area of Flanders very, very wealthy. So there was always a very strong connection between the British and the Flemish people who lived here long before the First World War. And then when the Germans invaded Belgium in 1914, the British saw that as their call to arms. This was their reason to come and join the war to defend neutral Belgium. And that brought them here to Ypres. It was a real source of pride to the British and Commonwealth nations that they defended Ypres. This was the only corner of Belgium that hadn't been occupied by the Germans and they were determined to defend it. Which is why, even though the entire town was destroyed, the British never left. They stayed here and they defended it. And that's why so many people died in this very small corner of Belgium. This entire building was skeletonized in the four years of war. There was not much left standing by the time the war finished in 1918 and you can still see the evidence of that. You can see these craters in the masonry that was left behind. Evidence of the shells that exploded in the street just here and sprayed the entire building with shrapnel. And when you stand back it looks pristine. It looks like a wonderful, beautiful, medieval building but it's when you get close and you see that damage and you see those holes in the side that you start to see the fury, the violence that occurred in the streets all around us and of course every building was just like this one. Smashed, destroyed, needing to be rebuilt. Remarkable to stand here. Directly opposite the Cloth Hall is this other magnificent structure. St Martin's Cathedral and this was the other dominant building in Ypres at the time of the war. Like the Cloth Hall it too was completely destroyed and had to be rebuilt. We're just behind the cathedral here and it's funny to think that for centuries as I was walking down these steps I would have been entering this beautiful old chapel but again thanks to the First World War today it's it's just an absolute ruin and you wonder for how many centuries people trod 
these pavers not realizing that the days of the chapel were certainly numbered. Remarkable that again they've left these deliberately as just little reminders of the wartime history of the town and there's no better reminder than this when we come over here in this area behind the chapel it's almost like a, a grotesque amusement park. These are parts of the chapel that were not incorporated when they reconstructed the building. We've got these old columns scarred with shell fire, statues, headless saints, a century down the road. The town has moved on and today it's prosperous and quite a beautiful place but these little reminders of the war are never far away and it's wonderful to come here and discover them. Everywhere I look in this town I see the devastation of the past revealed through the veneer of the present. But to truly understand the most difficult aspects of that past, I need to visit a building that is one of the great monuments to the fallen of the First World War. This is St George's Memorial Chapel in Ypres and it tells a story of two distinct but connected groups of people who were here in the immediate post-war years. Firstly, there was a very big British population living in Ypres in the 1920s. They were here to help rebuild the town and to build the cemeteries where thousands of people lie. But it also tells a story about pilgrims, families who were coming to Ypres to remember their lost sons and they wanted somewhere to come and reflect and to pray. And as you can see from the poppies all around me, this is still a place of remembrance and pilgrimage. The entire interior of the chapel is a commemoration, a memoriam to men killed during the fighting. We've got the bust of French up there, who was the commander in the very early stages of the fighting. And then memorials down to privates and ordinary men. In memory of Lieutenant Elvin Scott from his sister Molly. In memory of my son. You can't really absorb just how much grief is reflected here. I don't know of any other place on the Western Front that is a collective memorial like this to so many families. Every one of these plaques is honouring a man or a, or a unit that went to Ypres and never came home. It's just a, a really remarkable place. Much of the chapel was funded by donations from family members and ex-servicemen's groups who wanted to remember their lost comrades and lost sons and a lot of those contributions are remembered in these large plaques at the back and again just a whole range of units Australian Commonwealth Forces the 25th Machine Gun Company so some specific memorials to individuals there's a plaque over there saying how the heating system was donated by the returned members of one particular unit and then the focal point of course is the chapel here which has become since the earliest days of the chapel was a shrine to come and pay respects to the missing men. And as you can see from the tributes around us, still, still remains that way today. Just a short walk from St George's is the British Grenadier Bookshop, but this place stocks far more than just books. The shop's owner, Steve Douglas, has agreed to show me his personal collection of rare war memorabilia. Steve, it's quite an amazing shop you've got here. It's, uh, it's just a fantastic collection. Well, these are the pieces I don't really want to sell right now, but are very interesting and people are fascinated by, it. in many cases, are one of a kinds and, uh, uh, you know, I'm never, I'm never going to get again this helmet here. Everybody I show this to has never seen one before. It's a, a German World War I helmet with a Hessian camouflage on top of it with this chicken wire holding it all in place. British flying helmet here that came in one day. Somebody found it in their grandfather's uh, attic after he died. They cleaned out his house and he brought it in to sell to me and I got all excited about it. So I went on eBay and I found a pair of goggles to, to put on it. And about a week later, he came in with the original goggles. Oh, wow. There. He found it up there. You can also see evidence of just how savage the fighting was. And knives. There's and an American fighting knife there. Ooh. Triangular blade, which is, means it's only good for one thing. 
You can't slice your bread with it, that's for sure. And with the knuckle duster on the uh, The knuckle on the handle duster, well. yeah. Yeah, on the handle. This is an interesting piece. This is a fairly recent acquisition. What do you think that is? It looks like a grenade. It is a grenade, but there's no explosives. It does not explode. It's a gas grenade. Inside here would have been a glass ball with the gas chemical in it. So all it had to do is go against something that would deform enough to break the glass and release the gas. That is fantastic. So it is an amazing little thing, isn't it? That is incredible. But the soldiers apparently hated these things because they would keep breaking in their packs and stuff, causing big problems. So as soon as they got to their frontline trench where they were assigned, they would get rid of these. <laughs> it always amazes me the ingenious lengths we will go to to kill and maim each other when required. Yes, yes. This is one of my favorite pieces. A khaki combination candle box. Oh, look at that. <laughs> so clever, so simple, but so useful too. How do you find it living in a place like this, which is one of the most historic places yeah. you know, in the world? This is, this is a place that is just about history. How do you find living here every day and hearing these stories and touching these articles? Endlessly and fascinating. And you never know who's going to come in the door and have something to sell, something interesting, or some story to tell you or they're researching their relative or something, and you get all these stories, and every day there's something. Of all the First World War sites in Ypres, this one is definitely the most iconic. It's the Menin Gate. In fact, it's probably the most iconic site on the entire Western Front. It's stood here since 1927, and it's half a mausoleum, half a victory arch. This is at the eastern edge of the town. The battlefields are that way. The front line was that way. So this is the main route that troops would take when they headed out into the battlefields. So for many of the troops, this was the last part of Ypres that they saw. So it was a really fitting place after the war to build a monument remembering the missing, the missing soldiers. More than 54,000 names of missing Commonwealth and British soldiers are recorded on this monument. Whenever I visit the Western Front and try to make sense of everything that went on here, the bit that's the most difficult to get your head around is just the sheer scale. The scale of the numbers of people involved, the scale of the destruction, the scale of the dead and missing. And it's places like this that really bring that home to you because these are men missing from the fighting in the Ypres salient who have no known grave. British and Commonwealth men, South Africans, Australians, Canadians, all recorded here. It's not until you stand here and scan these thousands of names and think about the grieving communities that it all starts to make some sort of sense. We're really in the Australian corner now of the Menin Gate and all of these names around me are of Australian soldiers and there's, there's interesting stories everywhere you look. If you see just here we see two names, G and T Seabrook. These are the Seabrook brothers from Sydney and they actually served with their younger brother as well. He was an officer, they were simply privates. These two men, George and Theo Seabrook, served at the battle, in the Battle of the Menin Road, and they were both killed by the same shell. Their brother had not heard that his two brothers had been killed when he was wounded himself and he died the next day. So the three Seabrook brothers were killed on the 20 and the 21st of October, 1917. You can't help but stand here and just think what this means, especially when we see the Australian units and think about these grieving families back home. They never got to visit these memorials, the cemeteries where their loved ones lie. In the 1920s at this time, when there were so many grieving families, there was a famous painting of this memorial showing ghostly soldiers in front of it. And they would sell these to grieving families. And so the families would hang them in their house to think of their loved one whose name was recorded here. And they had a wonderful sentiment attached to them. On these paintings was inscribed the message, he's not missing, he's here. And I think that's a beautiful sentiment. These men are here, they're still here, their memories are here. And it's wonderful that today we can visit them and fulfill that pilgrimage that the families never got to. Leaving the Menin Gate brings us onto the massive ramparts that surround Ypres. And it's a sad truth that places that suffer through one war tend to suffer through future wars as well. If they're in a strategic location in one era, that will still apply in the future. And Ypres sums that up really well. 
It's famous for the First World War and the battles that went on here. It was also attacked very heavily in the Second World War. But these ramparts represent a much earlier conflict that went on here because in the 17th century, this was the northern outpost of the entire French Empire. And so the military architect Vauban built these massive ramparts to protect the town. And by the time of the First World War, they ran right around the eastern and southern sides of the town. It didn't prevent Ypres from being destroyed, but the ramparts did provide a measure of protection. And today we can still see signs of that. Honeycombed throughout the ramparts in Ypres are rooms just like this one, which for centuries served an important military purpose. Now this one, as we explore through it, now this was obviously a gun port. So in this room, when the ramparts were first built in the 17th century, this was for big cannons, which could be rolled up to these loopholes and blasting away at enemies beyond to defend the city. But in the First World War, these rooms had a really important purpose because the entire city of Ypres had been destroyed, had been reduced to rubble. The ramparts were really the only part of the whole town that hadn't been destroyed. So in rooms such as this one, important operations such as headquarters were, were set up. General John Monash, the commander of the Australian 3rd Division at the time, and later the commander of all the Australian troops on the Western Front, was set up in one of these chambers. But imagine what it was like. Shells would have rained down here every minute of the day. And imagine the noise, the concussion, the dust, the smoke. I don't know how they got any work done, how any battles were orchestrated, but this is where it was done, from chambers just like this one. And if we go further in, we find other rooms. It's a bit of a rabbit warren. This was possibly a well or a base for another gun. Perhaps that's been bricked in, that loophole. And another fascinating story about these rooms and the ramparts was what the men did here. Now, the town of Ypres was known by its French name during the war, Y-P-R-E-S, Ypres. But to the English tongues, that was a bit of a mouthful, so they called it Wipers. And during the war, they set up a satirical newspaper known as the Wipers Times, and it told funny stories about the goings on of men, their life in the trenches, their life in the Ypres salient. And it was in a room just like this one that they set up their printing presses and produced the Wipers Times. It's just wonderful that rooms like this have been preserved, that we can visit them today. This is the southern entrance and exit to the town of Ypres, and this is known as Lille Gate. The French city of Lille is in that direction. And this was another place that troops were often sent during the war when they headed out to the front line. The Menin Gate, the other main gateway, is on the eastern side of the town. It was very exposed to enemy shell fire. So troops were often sent this way, south of the town, then they'd make a big left hook and head out to the battlefields beyond. But I should add that no place was safe in the Ypres salient, because just down there is a place called Shrapnel Corner, so named because of the amount of artillery fire the Germans would put on it in the hope of catching the troops as they headed out to the front line. But there's something very special in Lilgate that I want to show you right here. These are original signs pointing to the cemeteries of the Ypres salient. They were put here in the 1920s. And the body today that administers all the cemeteries is called the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. But you'll notice on this sign, it says the IWGC, the Imperial War Graves Commission. This was the original body in the 1920s that built and maintained these cemeteries. Now, these are the only original markers that I know of on the Western Front. These weren't intended for visitors like us today. These were intended for pilgrims. These were intended for the original families who were coming over from England to the Western Front to visit the graves of their lost sons. And they would come here and read these markers and then head out into the battlefields to visit the graves of their lost boys. Just a wonderful connection with that history to stand here in this spot. This is Rampart Cemetery and it holds a pretty special place in my heart. It's one of my favourite cemeteries on the Western Front. It was the first Commonwealth Cemetery I ever visited many, many years ago, and I always love coming back here. It's a really great example of a battlefield cemetery. It was built in 1914 by French troops who were stationed up here, and then taken over by the British in 1915 and used until the armistice. And you can see from the layout of this cemetery, the graves are not particularly neatly laid out. There's big gaps between them. They're at strange angles 
and that suggests the urgency of the burials that took place here. If you're behind the lines next to a hospital, you had all the time in the world to build and lay out a cemetery very neatly, but here in the front line with shells falling all around, you had to do it quickly. And so this cemetery would have been created by men working at night, working under shell fire, and hurriedly trying to bury the men who'd been killed that day. A real mix of men from nationalities, this cemetery just represents the combined effort to fight this war against the Germans. This is a type of grave that's all too common in this part of the battlefields. It says, a soldier of the great war known unto God. And that means that the man who lies in this plot is unknown to us. We, we were not able to identify who he was. And it's important when we see those big memorials like the Menin Gate, the Tietval Memorial, the Australian National Memorial at Villas Bretno, and we see those thousands and thousands of names that we remember not all of those men are missing out in the fields. For the majority of them, they would lie in a cemetery in one of these graves, but we just can't match the man in the grave to the man on the memorial. So we will never know who this man is, but we can take comfort in the fact that his name is recorded just down the road on the Menin Gate. Visiting the Menin Gate in daylight is a very personal experience. You often have the whole place to yourself, but at night, the memorial transforms. It's approaching 8 p.m. and tonight, like every night, crowds have started to gather at the Menin Gate for something very, very special. Let's go and have a look. The Ypres Fire Brigade play the last post in honour of the men recorded on these walls around us. They do it every day, rain or shine. The only time they stopped was the four years during German occupation in the Second World War. And they restarted the service the day the town was liberated. It's one of the most special ceremonies on the Western Front. The last post, of course, is a very moving part of this service, but for me personally, it's the pipes that always get me. It's a very special service, the last post at Menin Gate, and I have to say I love coming here to Ypres. Every time I arrive in the town, it's a bit like catching up with an old friend. And a big part of that is the way that the people of Ypres embrace their wartime heritage in every aspect of their daily lives. You see it in all the shops on the main square, you see it in the wonderful museums in the area, and you definitely see it at incredible commemorative services like the last post that we've just seen here. To me, the people of Ypres embody a really wonderful notion, an idea that the horrors of the First World War, the violence, the oppression, the suffering 
all have been consigned to the past. But the lessons that that war can teach us about courage, about sacrifice, about basically just trying to be better human beings really belong here and now. And to me, that's what remembrance is all about. <laughs>